after Ahmed was released, he did what the best of people do. What did he do? He forgave all of those who harmed him, with the exception to the chief innovators, who he believed could not be given the benefit of the doubt. They were doing what they were doing consciously and upon knowledge. Everyone else was forgiven, including the ones who were lashing him. And Ahmad would recite the ayah, وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Let them pardon and let them overlook. Don't you want that Allah should forgive you? And Ahmad would say beautiful heart-warming or heart-melting words. He would say, مَاذَا يَنْفَعُكَ أَنْ يُعَذَّبَ أَخُوكَ الْمُسْلِمْ فِي سَبِيلِكَ How will you benefit, Ahmad would say, how will you benefit if your brother is punished because of you? How will you benefit? Pardon! If your brother is punished because of you. Ahmad, however, had taken an oath in Allah's name that he would not speak to anyone from the Muslims, particularly the scholars who gave in to the innovators and testified to their beliefs. Even if it was just outwardly, of course, till the day he died, he won't speak to them. And this included his lifelong friend and travel mate, Yahya ibn Ma'in. And Yahya ibn Ma'in was seven years older than Ahmad. Ahmad stopped talking to him. Yahya once came to visit Imam Ahmad during his illness. Yahya greeted him with salam. Ahmad didn't return his greeting. Yahya apologized to Imam Ahmad and he sought to excuse himself and he gave justifications as per why he professed to their beliefs when they were interrogating him and he was quoting an ayah from the Quran and a hadith from the Sunnah which excuse people who testify to false beliefs under duress. Ahmad kept his face turned away from Yahya. He didn't even look at him. Yahya said to Ahmad, you don't want to accept any of my excuses. So Yahya walked out of the door and he just sat outside in grief. Then another person who was with them in that room, his name is Abu Bakr, he came out and he sat next to Yahya. Yahya said to Abu Bakr, what did Ahmad say after I left? What did he say to you? Abu Bakr said, Ahmad said that all of those narrations that you are quoting, they are in reference to people who were under actual duress. They were being punished. So Allah gave them the excuse when they testified to false beliefs. They were under duress. He said, but the people like you, they were threatened with duress and then they succumbed to them. You were merely threatened and then you succumbed. Upon hearing this, Yahya ibn Ma'in, he said to himself, O oh, Ahmad, instruct as you wish. Do as you wish. May Allah forgive you. Because by Allah, I have never seen any human being beneath the sky who has greater understanding of Allah's religion than you. Ya Allah. Some of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's statement before we conclude. Imam Ahmad would say, Ma qalla fi dunya kana aqalla lil hisab. The lesser a person's worldly possessions are, the easier the accountability will be. Another one of Imam Ahmad's beautiful statements, he would say, Ana ilma ila an adkhul al -qabr. I will continue to pursue knowledge till the day I enter my grave. And someone once said to Imam Ahmad, when they saw him carrying his ink pot and his paper, they said, Father of Abdullah, you still carry around your pens and papers despite having become the Imam of the Muslims? It's like running around like a student with your pen and paper? You've become the Imam of the Muslims. He said, Ma'al Mahmara ila al With the ink pot to the graveyard. With the ink pot to the graveyard. And Imam Ahmad was once asked a question How are you this morning? Listen to this response, brothers and sisters, and take note of it. Shows you who Imam Ahmad was and how he thought and how he saw the world. How are you this morning? He said, How is the morning of a person who has a Lord who demands from us the obligations? And he has a Prophet who is demanding that he carries out his teachings. And he has two angels demanding that he corrects his actions. And he has a soul that demands its desires. And shaitan is demanding that he commits sins. 
And the angel of death who is eagerly awaiting to claim his soul. And a family who are demanding their expenditure. Wow, what a response to the question. How are you this morning? But that's how Ahmad was. All of these things are demanding things from me. Allah wants, has rights. The Prophet has rights. My soul is demanding things. Angel of death and family. That is a man who was conscious of Allah. And this is one of Ahmad's statements. As for the death of Imam Ahmad, it was during the reign of Al-Mutawakkil where the illness of Ahmad intensified and it weakened his body. But he would continue fasting. Al-Mutawakkil would send his doctors, Ibn Masawayhi, his personal doctor, to Ahmad to treat him and prescribe medicines. And Ahmad would not take any of the medication. So Ibn Masawayhi told the Khalifa, Ahmad's not ill. It's his continuous fasting and his minimal food and his intense worship that's fatiguing his body. La ilaha illallah. During his dying moments, Ahmad managed to indicate to his family that he wants wudu to be carried out on his body. And he communicated his wishes that his fingers are to be washed and water is to be passed through his fingers as well. In keeping with the sunnah, right down to his last breath. And when they had completed the wudu and his body was pure, during the forenoon of Friday in the year 241 after the Hijrah, in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal, the blessed soul of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal would return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was estimated that his funeral was attended by 800,000 people. There are other narrations that predict it was around 1.3 million people. And there are some narrations, Allah knows best how true they are, that estimates 2.5 million people. And what is interesting, and what is interesting is that Imam Ahmad used to say in his life, قُولُوا لِأَهْلِ الْبِدَعَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ يَوْمُ الْجَنَائِزِ Ahmad used to say in his life, say to the innovators, the funeral processions shall determine who is upon the truth. The funeral processions shall determine who is upon the truth. And look at the funeral procession of Ahmad. His intuition, his prediction was correct. As Abdul Wahhab al Warraq, he said that we don't know of a funeral procession, whether during Islam or pre Islam, that was larger than the funeral procession of Imam Ahmad. And then you take a look at the funeral procession of Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, the one who was really the cause of so much suffering of Imam Ahmad. It, his, his funeral procession was largely abandoned, barely attended. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Brothers and sisters, we have come to the end of this series. In conclusion of it, I want to leave you with a parting message. In just 100 years from now, every single listener to this series will be underground. Our bodies will have become part of the soul. And during that time, our fate with respect to paradise or hell would have been made known to us. In just 100 years from now, it will apply to you, it will apply to me. Meanwhile, the houses that we had left behind would have become homes for other people. Our clothes will be worn by others. Our cars will be driven by others. And as for you and me, we will be, for the most part, never thought about. I mean, for example, how often do you think about your great-granddad? How often does your great-grandmother cross your mind? See, our presence here on Earth today, this presence that we make so much noise about, and this presence that we shed so many tears about, Meanwhile, our houses that we had left behind would have become homes for, for other people. Our clothes would have become worn by others. Our cars will be driven by others. And as for us, you and I, for the most part, we will be never thought about again by anyone. I mean, how often do you think about your great-grandfather? How often does your great-grandmother cross your mind? Our presence here on earth today this, this presence that we make so much noise about, so much fuss about, we shed so many tears for, this presence of ours here on earth was preceded by so many generations before us. 
and shall be followed by so many generations who will come after us. And every generation that passes through this world barely finds the time it needs to just even take a glance at this world before finding itself needing to bid it farewell and handing over the baton, having not even fulfilled even a fraction of their ambitions. Our lives in reality are far shorter than what we had imagined. In just 100 years from now, every one of us who is watching this video and understanding these words will realize from within the grave just how worthless this world actually was. And how trivial those dreams that were centered on it were. Every one of us will be wishing that he had dedicated his life to the great matters of life, the matters of Islam, and that he had devoted all of his time and his effort to the collection of as many good deeds, particularly those good deeds that continue to benefit a person after his death. It is for this reason that it should be on the top of our list of priorities to leave behind us a legacy that will outlive our short lives that are rapidly, rapidly ending every second of the day. We should yearn to leave behind us a project that will feed our scrolls with good deeds when, when our limbs are no more. And that will cause the believers to speak well of us after we die of many generations to come. We should crave this. Just as Prophet Ibrahim السلام, craved this, he wanted people to speak well of him, the believers to speak well of him after he dies. Look at the dua, look at his speech to his community, followed by a dua. Qala afara'aytum ma kuntum ta'budun. He said, Have you not considered what you are worshipping? Antum wa aba'ukum al aqdamun, you and your forefathers. They are all enemies to me, Ibrahim said, except Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Who is he? Ibrahim says. He is the one who created me and guides me. And he is the one who feeds me and gives me drink. And when I fall ill, it is he is the one, he is the one who cures me. And he is the one who will cause me to die and then will resurrect me. And he is the one whom I hope will forgive my sin on the day of recompense. Then Ibrahim makes the dua, Rabbi habili hukman wa alhiqni bil salihin. My Lord, give me judgment and join me with the righteous people. And then he said, Waja'ali lisana siddiqin fil akhirin. And grant me, O oh Allah, a reputation of honor among the later generations of people. And in another ayah, Allah Almighty said about Ibrahim, وَتَرَكْنَا عَلَيْهِ فِي الْآخِرِينَ We left for him a favorable mention among the later generations. So what has happened as a result of this dua of Ibrahim? That, Ya Rabbi, give me a good reputation in the later generations of people. That dua that was backed up with, with a work ethic and sacrifice. Ibrahim has, because of it, now become a celebrated figure across the nations of the world. The Jews believe in Prophet Musa and have rejected Prophet Isa, Jesus. Whilst the Christians believe in Prophet Isa, Jesus, but they rejected Prophet Muhammad. However, all three of these religions are unanimously agreed that Ibrahim is an ally of Allah who should be praised and celebrated. Ya Allah. The lives of these four Imams have displayed the importance of living a life in preparation for the hereafter. And that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees ikhlas, sincerity within a person's heart, Allah will take it upon himself to sponsor your efforts, to sponsor your project. Even if you are ill-resourced, even if you're outvoted, even if you feel weak, Allah will nurture your deeds till you meet Him on the Day of Judgment and your deeds will be like mountains. Doubting this is to doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So live for the great matters. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with the enthusiasm of a believer who hopes for paradise and is excited for it, start planning for your religion, start planning for your hereafter. Then just watch how Allah will guide each and every one of your footsteps and how Allah will open up doors of clarity, 
guidance and inspiration which you could never have imagined Allah will facilitate but take that step towards him and start planning I want to close with one final example a contemporary one if I was to show you a picture of this man I think most of us may not recognize him I choose this one because it's a recent example and we like recent examples who is this man maybe a lot of us will not know, but if I show you a picture of this booklet now, most Muslims across the world will recognize it. Fortress of the Muslim, Hasnul Muslim. A booklet of dua, which he compiled. Prayers that are to be said in various times of the day, different circumstances in a person's life. The author of this very well-known booklet was the very same man in the image whom you just saw. He is Sheikh Saeed. Ibn Wahf al-Qahtani, who passed away in October 2018. The idea of the booklet is not novel. The size is not enormous. The graphics are not existent. But what seems to be the situation, that it was a moment of sincerity which Allah saw within the heart of this man, and so this booklet was sent across the continents of the world being translated into so many different languages and printed millions of times covering the East and the West and now Muslims from all across the world are remembering Allah, praising Him, glorifying Him under the supervision of this simple, modest booklet. Can you just imagine the amount of good deeds which we hope that this man has accumulated because of this simple book and continues to do so? Now, are, are you saying to me that you're incapable of producing something along these simple lines? Of course you can. And of course you must. And one last message before, before we bid you farewell. It is so important to remember that the efforts that you exert today may only come into fruition many years after your death. Don't despair if you don't see your efforts taking off in the life of this world. Regardless of what the nature of your project may be, it is different from person to person and the circumstances vary. Your duty is just to sow the seed with a dedication, to plan, to consult, to start. Then Allah decides how and when to give life to matters and place barakah in them. And an example of this is Ali ibn Tahir al-Sulami, a key example in this department. He was a jurist upon the Shafi'i school of thought teaching in the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. Now, Imam Ali authored a book which he called Kitab al-Jihad, meaning the Book of Jihad, which details the rulings of Jihad and explains the different Quranic verses that address it, uh, the different duties of different categories of people, and he frequently cites the works of Imam al-Ghazali, who was also, of course, Shafi'i. You can say that this was pretty much the very first scholarly response to the Crusaders. Now, the initial readings of this book, they were in around the year 1105, six years after Jerusalem had just been conquered by the Crusaders. Now, subhanAllah, a person would assume that these readings of this book, the book of Jihad, would be popular, right? Because of the urgency of the matter and, and uh, you know, Al-Aqsa has been taken away. But subhanAllah, the readings of these books were very poorly attended and the book was largely forsaken thereafter. It was forgotten. A year after this, the author, Ali ibn Tahir, he passes away. He didn't live to see much. Seems to be the end of his works, right? Wrong. In the year 1187, his book, subhanAllah, managed to find its way to the limelight once again. And there was another public reading of it, 81 years after his death, which provided the Muslims with a much needed push forward. And so the Muslim armies were consolidated. They came together in a really spectacular way of uh, gathering different diversities and ethnicities and languages. And Ali ibn Tahir's book would be publicly read again in the lead and the build-up to the famous Battle of Hittin, a battle where Jerusalem would be recaptured by the Muslims under the leadership of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. What does that tell you? It tells you that people's talents are different and they vary and their interests and their circumstances vary. But what is key is that a person 
gathers his thoughts, his ambitions, her talents, her time, his resources, and then devises a clearly defined plan as per how they shall be invested for the greatest matters of life. And that is Allah and the home of the hereafter. And when you do that, to realize that the fruits of your work may show up during your life or many years after your death.